Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market. We don't want that money that you're getting Livestock leaders are called to Congress. The, and rancher share has the new administration keeps some of the old ways on China trade policy. You may have 95% of the components. That Supply chain challenges in, in a COVID country. world. 5 million metric tons down to about 72 and a half. And market analysis with Arlen Suderman Canada next. Its production dropped sharply as well. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics or meteorology or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, October 8 edition of Market to Market the Weekly Journal of Rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. The inconsistency of the job recovery added another data point in September. U.S. employers added 194,000 jobs last month with gains in transportation and warehousing and losses in local government education jobs for positions like bus drivers and cafeteria workers. The unemployment rate dropped to 4.8 from 5.4% a month earlier. The trade deficit widened in August as imports greatly outpaced exports to open the ravine to $73.3 billion. And agriculture has been one sector that has enjoyed healthy exports like beef and pork. This week, the Biden administration added an additional $100 million to an already funded $500 million program designed to help small and medium-sized processors. USDA says the loans are designed to help those operations upgrade facilities with the intention of expanding slaughter capacity industry-wide. John Torpy reports on a hearing aimed at some of the bigger players in the meat market. The uh, goal here is obviously to strike a better balance between supply and demand, between processing capacity and competition, with greater transparency so that we can have a stable, dependent, and fair market. USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack appeared before the House Agriculture Committee this week as part of a hearing to look at the state of the livestock and processing industry. There's no question that we are short of capacity, which is one of the reasons why it's more difficult for farmers to get a fair price uh, for what they're raising. Over the past few months, Vilsack has continually called on Congress to revamp the rules of the Packards and Stockyards Act in order to level the playing field between producers and meat processors. So you see, Senator Charles Grassley of Iowa also testified before the committee, highlighting the lack of market transparency. The reauthorization of the mandatory price reporting is the vehicle available where we can add additional price transparency and price discovery measures, and that's what I'm advocating. Witnesses appearing before the committee point to consolidation among the largest beef processors has created an unbalanced market for producers. But I will tell you this, from NCBA's standpoint, we don't want that money that you're giving out to go to the four large packers. They don't need any more money. We need that to go to the small producers and the medium-sized regional plants because they can make a difference for us. Work stoppages at processing facilities brought on by the global pandemic exacerbated the existing bottleneck problems in the livestock processing industry. Producers were left waiting with livestock at the packing house door, causing a price decline for farmers and ranchers. Meanwhile, the cost for consumers climbed at the meat counter. Between 1980 and 2020, the retailer's percentage of the beef food dollar has grown by 65%. And the Packers' share has increased even more by 70 percent. During this same time, the farmer and rancher's share has fell by more than 40 percent. I ask you, how fair is this? A representative for the North American Meat Institute countered, pointing out the fluid nature of the industry. The cattle and beef industry is driven by supply and demand. And the cattle market is cyclical. Not long ago, the cattle market was the reverse of today. 
In 2013, 14, and 15, the herd was small, and producers were making record profit while packers were losing money. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. The phase one trade deal brokered during the Trump administration called for China to buy American to the tune of $207 billion. As of August 1, the Chinese are 30 percent behind pace, according to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. The biggest sector of phase one is manufacturing, where only half the goal of $123 billion has been met. Now, more than $43 billion in agricultural purchases are called for, and to date, at 92 percent of the target. After more than eight months in office, the Biden administration concluded their review of trade deals with China, signaling the intention to reduce tensions, albeit in a subtle manner. Here's Peter Tubbs. Third, we continue to have serious concerns with China's state-centered and non-market trade practices that were not addressed in the phase one deal. As we work to enforce the terms of phase one, we will raise these broader policy concerns with Beijing. And we will also directly engage with China on its industrial policies. Our objective is not to inflame trade tensions with China. While the Biden White House is monitoring China's adherence to the phase one agreement negotiated by the Trump administration, the current White House has already scrapped plans to negotiate a second deal. U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai said this week, the U.S. will be lowering tariffs in areas where China has met goals while maintaining duties in sectors under dispute. The administration is also promoting more domestic spending to improve the global competitiveness of the United States, focusing on education and infrastructure. Durable coexistence requires accountability and respect for the enormous consequences of our actions. I am committed to working through the many challenges ahead in this bilateral process in order to deliver meaningful results. But above all else, we must defend to the hilt our economic interests. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Supply chain disruptions have become a new normal for manufacturers, retailers, and consumers. Those managing the supplies are left to juggle daily and hourly changes in what's available or has arrived for assembly. Industrial and agricultural manufacturer Vermeer Corporation is based in Pella, Iowa, and has dealt with those same supply problems. I sat down with CEO Jason Andringa this week to hear about what hurdles they've had to clear. But yet, this sort of COVID leading into the supply chain challenge is something that's unprecedented. In the last quarterly meeting that we had for our team members at Vermeer, um, you know, I, I said, we, we can't even look back and say it's not been this bad in 10 years or 20 years. It's never been this bad. So, you know, we've been around for 73 years and the supply chain challenges have never been this challenging. And, you know, our, our suppliers are doing the best they can. We're having very transparent, um, straightforward conversations with them. It's just a matter of, of COVID caused companies to pull back. And instead of demand for goods tapering back, it actually accelerated and we've been playing catch up ever since. And um, very much driven by workforce shortages and the other thing, which is kind of hard to get your mind around, is you may have the 95% of the components to build a machine, but it's not done until you have 100%. And so you, you have 95% of what you need, and you're waiting on that 5%, and that 5% keeps changing. Um, it's, it's not consistent. What is that final 5% that you need to finish a machine? And uh, those are the challenges that our supply chain team are working on literally not daily, but hourly, trying to make sure that we're getting the components in that we need. That 5%, is there any, you, you talk about it shifting and evolving. Mm -hmm. Is there ever a part where you've said, well, why can't we just do that 5%? Because is Vermeer one of those companies that <clears throat> you didn't make everything here, you would bring in some supplies? Like a lot of the bigger ones have done that now. They don't make everything in house that they used to. So have you had a discussion where you've said, well, maybe we're going to have to start doing 
some of these things ourselves. We, we have had some of those discussions. It's interesting with regards to doing work with um, sheets of steel. We're actually quite vertically integrated as it is. We do a lot of our own bending, machining, um, turning, welding, a lot of the operations that have to do with um, the steel that makes up our equipment. And it's ironic, even though the price of steel has gone up like crazy, we have really not had significant challenges with regards to steel. But when we think of some of the other components, it, it's not as easy as just thinking that we're going to make them because our suppliers have supply chain constraints. So if we decided that you know, we were gonna do what this supplier is doing, suddenly we would have the supply chain challenges that they already have. What's been the biggest frustration in all of this? You have huge demand, you have the facilities to do it, you've got the team to do it, and you just can't get in all the components you need to build the full machines. If we instantly had all the supply that we need, then we would instantly need to hire a lot more people. And you know we're really tailoring the rate at which we hire people based on trying to make sure we can keep work in front of those team members. So that's the biggest challenge, is just knowing that customers are gonna wait months to get their hands on a piece of Vermeer equipment that they need, and we desperately wanna build it faster, and we just can't. Uh, I heard you give an interview recently where you said, we normally stock our equipment in a certain spot, kind of as like a launching point, a yeah. go point. You, have you been able to do that this year? No, and, and that has been another challenge. You know, so far there has been you know, a couple hurricanes that have hit the United States and caused damage, and it's not easy to kind of build up a stock that can be immediately deployed after a hurricane, but we, we like to try. And you know, this year that has been more challenging than ever before. And so a hurricane strikes, our, our dealer will inform us of how much equipment they think that they will need to, to help mm -hmm. and support and you know, get into the hands of their customers to do this work. Give me two products that have been a challenge for you, maybe before and after, you know, as you talk about the evolving 5%. Yeah, and it, it once again, it keeps changing. So at times it feels like, you know, maybe hydraulic componentry is our number one issue. At times it feels like wiring harnesses are our number one issue. Engines, um, components that go into track systems, uh, hoses for radiators and, and other hydraulic componentry. So it honestly, it just keeps changing. But at the same time, you know, once again, um, you know, I feel as though our suppliers are, you know, doing the best that they can to you know, get the workforce they need, to try to plan for it, to try to accommodate us. Um, we have very constructive and transparent and straightforward conversations. It's just um, when the pandemic broke, everybody kind of pulled back and we've, we've been playing catch up ever since. And um, for a while it felt like we were not too far away from starting to eat into our backlog. And now the past few months it's gone you know, the wrong direction again where um, our ability to build to meet demand just keeps falling farther behind. And we're not alone in that. You know, we, we know from other manufacturers in Iowa and around the country, we're all in the same boat. Um, it's, it's all over the news, but, uh, but yeah, it's just, it's just frustrating when you know customers are desperate to get their hands on yeah. a new piece of equipment and they've got months of backlog. The full interview will be available Tuesday through our YouTube and MTOM podcast feed. Next, the Market to Market Report. Traders took a tepid response at news of export sales to Mexico while harvest pressure carried more weight and a return of the oats nose comments. For the week, December wheat lost 21 cents while the nearby corn contract declined 11 cents. China appears to be back buying U.S. soybeans, while the Brazilians intend to plant more of the crop. The November soybean contract dropped four cents. December meal shed 8.20 per ton. December cotton added 5.88 per hundredweight. In the dairy parlor, November class three milk futures moved 50 cents higher. A mixed week in the livestock sector, December cattle added 5.05. November feeders gained 8.25, and the December lean hog contract weakened 3.68. In the currency markets, U.S. dollar index improved three ticks. November crude oil added 3.78 per barrel. 
COMEX Gold fell 60 cents per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index improved almost 19 points to finish at 581.10. Now, here to provide insight is market analyst Arlen Suderman. Hey, Arlen. Good to be back with you, Paul. So, we could just talk wheat and just talk about Minneapolis and how good of a week it was for there, but there's much more to that wheat story. What's in play here? Well, we've really tightened up the supplies of major exporting countries, um, and that's where the bulk of the milling wheat supplies come. And I think the Minneapolis market has kind of become the poster child for that, because obviously we had a short spring wheat crop uh, on both sides of the border, both in Canada and in the United States. And so that's leading the way higher. And uh, overall, we're st still trying to stay competitive. You know, it depends on which class of wheat you're in. We saw the winter wheat market struggling a little bit through the week while Minneapolis was making new contract highs, but it still comes down to a smaller crop in Russia, smaller crop in the United States and the Northern Plains, smaller crop in Canada, some issues in other producing areas of the world as well. So is this one of those pauses before we move higher? Very possibly, it really depends on where we go from here. I think we've got priced in now the um, the current known fundamentals. So now as we look at how many acres are we going to plant Russia, there's a sense that we're going to be down on acres there by how much. Uh, and then look at the Southern Hemisphere crop, Australia and Argentina. We've got some areas there where we're dry and Argentina's crop ratings has started to decline again as they started to dry out again. Let's do the weather report here, Arlen. I think in your backyard, it is low 80s. It's low 80s here. But there's a change in the weather pattern in, say, the Upper Plains, which will impact any uh, wheat planting, or in the Southern Plains, I should say. Um, how quickly does weather become a story when you transition from wheat to, say, corn? Well, <clears throat> we are moving back into a La Nina pattern. That's more of a factor now for South America, especially dry for Argentina and Southern Brazil. Uh, short term, what we're watching is these rains in the Northern Plains here in the days ahead. That could be a problem for unharvested soybeans in particular. If you go wet, dry, wet, dry, you cause that the soybean pod to swell and to shrink, swell and shrink, and it pops open, you have beans on the ground. So that'll be a concern and we'll be watching there. Some heavy rains are anticipated over the next few days. Uh, so that's certainly something to watch there. Brazil, it's really hard to say now whether we're going to have a short crop or not because the correlations are weaker. Southern Brazil's at the highest risk. And Argentina, the new European models that came out, the monthly models that came out this week, look quite dry for the growing season for Argentina. So that could be a real concern going forward. If Let's stay in this soybean discussion here for a moment. Uh, harvesters are rolling, uh, probably going to see a big percentage jump come Monday. But you have this concern, I don't know if it's concerned, this return of China to the market. Earlier in the week, no, 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 we don't want any. Now we're back. Uh, when it comes to soybeans, you mentioned South America. You mentioned, or I mentioned China. What do you mention as the big story in soybeans? It really comes down to the lack of demand right now in China. Um, hog feeding margins are very low right now. And so while we're seeing power outages that have shut down over 20 crushing plants, as I talked to my sources in China, they said, yeah, that's a problem. But the bigger problem is a lack of demand for meal because of these poor feeding margins. And we have a very narrow window in order to get our business done with China. Because once they start, Brazil starts harvesting its new crop after the first of the year, because of currency exchange rates, they're going to be the cheaper source. So we have to do our business now, between now and January. And um, so we need to see the shipment pace pick up. And one of the reasons it's not is because of the weak meal demand near term because of those poor feeding margins. Soy oil has been a story, but let's flip over to crude oil and its impact on the corn market. Uh, crude's had one of those weeks where it fell out of bed midweek, came back a little bit. Uh, I think we reported here on the week, uh, over week, 5% gain. What's crude oil doing to the corn market? Is that the biggest influencer right now in corn, Arlen? Well, it's certainly one of the major factors. Uh, crude oil is moving higher, seven-year highs. Um, certainly a factor kind of challenging or instigating the, the inflation focus once again, 
simultaneously with yields on 10-year treasuries going up about 30 basis points over the last week or 10 days, kind of reflecting that inflation expectation. Uh, crude oil, natural gas, coal at record high prices, natural gas at record high prices in some parts of the world, not there yet in the United States, but certainly high, shutting down some fertilizer plants, that's starting to re reduce projections for corn acreage next year. But the high energy prices of the fossil fuels is also increasing the focus on the new renewable fuels. And soy oil is certainly a big part of that. Palm oil hit record highs this week because of that. Canola oil being supported and also corn oil. Corn oil is also a very attractive, more attractive than soy oil really for use in these new renewable fuels. We just don't have as much of it. That, that's all per, kind of providing support. I did not have corn oil on the bingo sheet for this week, Arlen, but what I did have was oats. What's the oats knowing it's trading above corn? Is this going to be a long-term, short-term, I don't know what term impact on wheat or corn or soybeans moving forward? Yeah, those of us who have been around a while like to use that phrase, oats and oats. I'm not sure that the fundamental connection is what it used to be. Um, but Canada had a poor crop. U.S. imports the majority of the oats that it consumes. And because of the drought in the southern plains of Canada, Canada had a short crop and some quality issues. That means fewer exportable supplies to come south of the border into the United States. Um, that means that those feeding oats have to look for other feeds. So it's part of the overall feed equation okay. right now, helping support the feed grain complex. All right, uh, we'll get to the story of livestock in a moment. I got a viewer question I really want to slip in here that's important. Ryan in Rapid City, South Dakota was asking us, with corn and soybean yields coming in seemingly higher than expected, have the chances of a harvest rally gone out the window or might we see a bump in prices towards the end of the season? I don't think a, a rally has has gone out the window. I'm not going to forecast it by any means. But what I'm seeing and what we're seeing as we survey our people across the Midwest is that corn yields nationally are coming down a little bit. They were higher than expected in the Western Belt where it was so dry. That's the good news for those farmers. But in the East where they were expected to be record high, and in some locations they still are, they're not quite as good as expected. Too wet, a lot of variability in the fields, late season disease pressure, the crop didn't finish well, didn't fill well, so we're seeing lower yields in the east. And so nationally, we're seeing corn yields ratchet down a little bit. Soybean yields have been better than expected almost across the Midwest. Again, a lot of variability, but I think we'll see soybean yields go up on Tuesday, corn yields come down a little bit. All right, feeder market up $8.25, that's 5%. What's the big pull here in feeders? Is it what you talked about with the feed issue? Yeah, of course, the cattleman is always optimistic. Things are always going to get better. We're seeing a little bit more strength in, um, it, it, we're seeing a little bit more strength in the fat cattle uh, opportunities going forward and optimism there. So they feel like they can pay more for the feeders. We're also seeing some rains in the forecast for the Southern Plains. We're going to have to see that actually happen. We've really been drying out in Oklahoma and in Texas. Um, our cow numbers have been declining for the last six months. Um, so the supply of feeders is gonna be declining. Supply of fat cattle eventually will be declining. That's part of the optimism in the live cattle market as well. Um, but again, it's part of the money flow and the optimism and in, in the inflation and, and just the positive put money into the commodities type of uh, mindset. This hog market last week, huge story. This week gave a little bit of it back. What's the pull in hogs? Well, we have a problem in hogs and expectations that we're going to see supplies increase faster than demand. Demand has been really good, but seasonally goes down this time of year. Uh, but supplies haven't been what USDA says either. Our pig litters haven't been. We've had some disease problems in the United States this year that have negatively impacted litter size. Um, when you look at demand and exports, we've had a lot of good exports, but China's the big focus and really been declining with their prices. In fact, in the last monthly data that just came out, we sent China more beef than we did pork. I don't know if that's ever happened before. 
That is a uh, story that we will talk about. One thing that we'll unplug real fast, you've got about 10 seconds to say cotton. Has it hit its peak? Well, um, there's a lot of factors that could take cotton higher um, right now. And it's battling with other crops for acres. China is really buying cotton right now, and that's really driving it. Good job. We'll do that. Uh, we'll expand on cotton when we get to Market Plus. And also, Arlen, you also want to talk about uh, inflation and uh, China National Day. So a lot to come up here in Market Plus. Thank you, Arlen. That will do it for this installment of Market to Market and the TV show. We will talk more in Market Plus, so join us. Find that on our website of markettomarket.org. We are so very close to a milestone on our YouTube page. Will you and your ringing of our bell put us over the top of 5,000 subscribers? Click subscribe at Market to Market when you search that on YouTube and be in our inner circle of knowing when the stories, Market Plus, and full program are ready for viewing. Next week, the panel of analysts returns to look at some peaks and valleys of the commodities around government reports. Thank you so very much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics or meteorology or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.